Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to this live program at all three principles. Today, our guest for now is Dr. Ronald Navarro from California, United States. Dr. Navarro joined Kaiser Permanente as an orthopedics and sports medicine specialist in 1997 after a fellowship in shoulder arthroscopy at the University of Pittsburgh. He is now director for clinical affairs at the nascent Kaiser Permanent Bernard Tyson School of Medicine and has been the chief of the Department of Orthopedics during 2000 to 2008, and also past director of orthopedic sports medicine at the Kaiser Permanent South Bay. He became regional orthopedic surgery chief, overseeing all orthopedic services in Southern California in 2013, and continues to serve in that position. Dr. Navarro was inducted into the exclusive American Shoulder and Elbow Society and is now a full active member. He recently completed a term as a president of the California Orthopedic Association after serving as member at large for the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, Board of Directors, from 2017 to 2019. Dr. Navarro also serves as director of the Kaiser Permanent Shoulder Arthroplasty Registry and he has authored several articles in shoulder and knee surgery. His current research is in the role of shoulder arthroplasty registries in tracking patient outcomes, orthopedic treatment in ethnic groups, and how data can adapt surgeon behavior in this time of healthcare reform. So today is my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Ronald Navarro from California, United States. Over to you, Ron. Dr. Gopalan, it's my pleasure to be with you today. It's my huge honor to be invited uh, to help uh, uh, work with uh, everybody on this uh, 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 webinar and to uh, provide information I hope will be very helpful to you. I have no conflicts with this uh, presentation. In 2015, the, in the journal Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons, the Rothman Group described that infections will occur after looking at a national inpatient sample large database from 2002 to 2011 and showed that it was uh, a uh, prosthetic joint infection rate was just under 1%. And the infections were seen to be costly and they costed them out at an, an additional of 17,000 American dollars each for each hospitalization. Thereafter, in 2018, a um, group uh, that was uh, first authored by Jason Clark, but Dr. Uh, Rich Hawkins, the famous shoulder surgeon, was the senior author in this work, uh, did describe a uh, prevention protocol that was uh, suggested and, and really well described. And I'm putting all these articles up uh, and, and there will be a handout for uh, made available by Dr. Gopalan for you too. So you don't have to uh, scribble this stuff down or take pictures of the screen but just to tell you that there are uh, ideas around uh, prevention. So today I wanna to tell you more about that. So um, we will talk about patient factors that may uh, help to uh, prevent a periprosthetic total joint infection with the context and background that I've given you, preoperative factors, perioperative factors, including intraoperative factors, systems thinking protocols, and lastly, a, a very nice description of some great work that was recently done by a group uh, uh, looking at the infection and uh, working through a consensus statement through that. So today, We'll be talking about, uh, for a lot of the talk, we'll be talking about uh, the, uh, the major infectious agent, Cudibacterium acnes, formerly uh, Propionobacter acnes. And so at some points in the slides, I will tell you, it still says P. acnes because that's what the articles described it as at that point. And I felt uh, best to be honored, honoring the article as it was written rather than the change in the name more recently. As you all know, the name has been changed. So let's look at some patient factors. We all talk about modifiable factors uh, um, when we talk about patient factors that we bring to surgery. And certainly uh, diabetes, smoking, excessive alcohol use, anemia, uh, um, uh, excessive weight or, and, and nutritional deficits uh, get both on both sides of the coin can be modifiable. And, and patients that I have um, 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 are, uh, um, anesthesiologists, uh, uh, Society of America scores of greater than two, they probably are combining multiple, multiple medical problems. 
in in um, in converse, is there uh, uh, some that are difficult or not modifiable? I have um, obesity in this column, and I talked about it in the other column because it is very hard to reduce weight. Inflammatory arthropathies can be treated to some degree with with uh, meds, but they're not uh, in many cases not uh, eradicatable. Renal failure, hepatitis C, HIV, prior surgery. Interestingly, male sex uh, is a uh, it's of course. Uh, and not too modifiable, but it's also been seen to have uh, a, a adverse effect at times in some studies. And um, rheumatoid arthritis uh, uh, disease modifying agents sometimes can have uh, um, some effects. And uh, so maybe it is modifiable in that you can stop it, but the uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis can become uh, more problematic. So let's look at some of the preoperative factors. Murray and others talked about uh, uh, in a study, a really nice study that compared uh, sage cloth or chlorhexidine cloths or cloths or wipes that are uh, readily available on the open market and suggested that they be used uh, preoperatively for uh, some days before surgery in a regimen that they describe. And then they would compare that to soap and water. They checked positive cultures and they were able to reduce uh, coagulase negative staph uh, by uh, a reduction of 30% in the uh, um, sage cloth wipe grouping versus 70% in the um, in the uh, um, soap and water grouping. P. acnes was reduced not as much, 46 versus 58%, so did not reach statistical significance. Shear and others looked at uh, um, the idea now comparing sage cloth wipes, which I just talked about in the prior study, versus uh, um, benzoyl peroxide. And they found that benzoyl peroxide actually out, uh, um, out competed or, or did be a better job of reducing P. acnes than uh, the sage cloth wipes and the effect remained for after two hours. Sabetta and Paul Sethi, a personal friend of mine, uh, did a really interesting other study in, in uh, Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery in 2015 and showed that that same benzoyl peroxidite uh, um, re reduced uh, P. acnes uh, if it's used for uh, 48 hours before. So two studies that both show that benzoyl peroxide has a great effect if used as a topical treatment in the preoperative days before surgery uh, via the regimens described in the studies. MRSA is a big problem. Uh, many patients are colonized, this uh, uh, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. So many um, groups have talked about uh, trying to um, screen these patients. And uh, if, the one, if there are certain numbers that have uh, um, a um, growth of MRSA, then you can treat them. There are others. In, in fact, my group, uh, my, my uh, organization, Kaiser Permanente in California, in Southern California, has just decided to treat everybody uh, using um, uh, povidine iodine within two hours as, uh, of cut, and it's as good as uh, mupiracin, which is also tr uh, treatable BID for five days before. So some people say, let's screen, but that's very costly to screen all these people to do the testing and to have them come in and get tested and then read the test and then treat only the ones before. So some others have just decided to just proactively treat everybody uh, for this. And so it's the cost of a uh, test and treat of versus some versus the cost of treating all, but this relatively uh, low cost uh, treatment is probably beneficial in uh, reducing the risk of MRSA. On to a very different subject, axillary hair. In your surgeries, do you remove or shave the axillary hair before you get to the before you get to the surgery perioperatively in the pre-op holding area or in the operating room just before the surgery? Um, this great study by Marisek and others showed that axillary hair clipped has a greater bacterial burden uh, um, than not clipping, and the P. acne's uh, burden was the same in clipped versus non-clipped hair. So um, 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 the uh, uh, the idea here is uh, you probably don't need to clip the hair and it, it probably reduces the burden of uh, P. acnes after prep if you don't clip the hair. So interesting study, it kind of goes against long held beliefs of clipping the hair. Let's stop, go on and move to preoperative antibiotics right in the, uh, in the um, 
uh, um, hour before the surgery when the patient arrives to the uh, uh, pre-op holding area. Crane and others, an antimicrobial, a, a journal that I don't read very often, um, looked at uh, pre-op penicillin and cephalosporins, uh, and they showed that it treated uh, P. acnes very well. Vanco, Vanco was uh, uh, only had fair activity, uh, activity versus P. acnes, and um, there is a P. acnes strain which is 7% resistant to clindamycin. My group in Southern California did study with our um, shoulder uh, um, arthroplasty registry um, that Dr. Gopalan uh, did describe, uh, I was involved with earlier, that uh, Vanco is better than Clinda for uh, penicillin allergic, uh, allergic patients. And there, there's uh, um, less uh, uh, P. acnes uh, infection uh, with uh, this grouping uh, of patients. Uh, this was published in the uh, journal, for, journal of uh, um, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Saltzman's looking at skin prep, looked at chloroprep and compared it to duraprep. And they saw that chloroprep was better than duraprep and, and, and iodine against coagulase negative staph, but there was no difference for the P. acnes uh, with these uh, skin preps right at the time of surgery. Fandis and others uh, looked at uh, P. acnes and showed that it persists in the dermis despite antibiotics and skin prep. So I'm taking th you through a lot of different factors. I know it's mind boggling, but hopefully the handout will help you. Um, uh, looking at body exhaust suits and hoods, um, Hooper in the JBGS British, which is now called, I think, uh, Bone and Joint, uh, uh, in 2011, uh, in, uh, showed increased levels of bacteria and increased uh, um, uh, um, surgical infections uh, in um, total hips and total knees. Uh, and so he, therefore, th their group, therefore, did not recommend body and exhaust suits and hoods. I don't wear them during my shoulder arthroplasty cases. I hope you don't see me as cavalier in that action, but I haven't seen an increased rate of uh, infections by not using them. In terms of adhesive drapes, a really great Cochrane review in 2015 looked at any adhesive that covered the incisions had actually higher risk of infection. Isn't that interesting? Higher risk of infection if you cover it. So as seen here in this imaging and depiction, um, um, it was better suggested to seal and drape the edges well, where you go from sterile to non-sterile environments, but not draping the incisions itself. And uh, the idea of iodine impregnated dra drapes did not have any difference in their, uh, in their really nice uh, review. What about changing gloves? Davis and others in a, in a now older study showed that there's contamination uh, um, with, uh, with just the setup after drape, draping, after bone preparation, before implant placement, after reduction of an, a replaced joint, and after cementing. And so um, in that older now study, they did suggest changing the, dra the, the gloves at, at least after draping. What about the idea of glove itself perforation? Another uh, journal I don't read very often, Surgical Infections, uh, show, showed, uh, and it was written, this article was written by Makama and others, showed that in a randomized controlled trial versus uh, single versus double gloving, there's a 15% perforation rate of single gloves in their study versus a, and there's a 1.2% uh, perforation of, of the inner of a double gloved uh, grouping. So it does argue for the idea of double gloving just be, as a routine uh, um, a factor in uh, utilizing gloves and this concept of perforation, especially in orthopedic surgery, uh, uh, where there's a lot of handling of, of uh, uh, both the, um, the instrumentation and hammers and mallets, et cetera, uh, it's probably better to double glove. The skin knife, there's even uh, papers on the skin knife and, and good research on that. Should we use a separate skin knife for the skin? Uh, once again, in the uh, uh, Brit British JBJS, um, now bone and joint, uh, there is bacterial growth from skin blades, the inside blades and uh, in controls a uh, much less. So there, uh, this article in short really uh, emphasized the uh, use of a second deep knife. So you make one incision on the skin and then you pass that blade off and uh, any uh, deeper uh, utilization of a, a scalpel uh, should be utilized with a, uh, a different uh, knife blade. 
surgical time. We all know that uh, uh, longer surgical time does have some risk uh, for infections generally. So this nice uh, um, um, article by Proctor and others in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons and, and uh, studied both the American College of Surgeons database and the NISQIP database and showed that every 30 minutes of uh, lengthier surgery leads, leads to a 2.5% increased risk of surgery. On to laminar flow. The use of laminar flow actually led to a significant increase in revision for early infection after total hip arthroplasty in that same Hooper JBJS British article that I had quoted earlier. Uh, there were no differences seen in knee replacements. And so uh, certainly the study has not been done with uh, total shoulder replacements. So maybe that's the next study we all should uh, invest our uh, time in to look at that with regard to shoulder arthroplasty. Vancomycin powder has been really um, uh, banting about, and uh, this group uh, uh, published in JSCS Open Access, Evan Letterman was one of the authors. He's my, uh, a good friend from my college days, and um, they showed that vancomycin powder exhibited bactericidal activity against P. acnes. Another group, uh, uh, which was uh, co-authored, a senior author by Larry Higgins, uh, showed that there's cost-effectiveness of vancomycin for preventing infections after shoulder arthroplasty at a break even level. They thought they did show that the cost to treat an infection is over 47,000 American dollars and the absolute risk of reduction uh, if the vancomycin costs $2.50 uh, per thousand milligrams, uh, the powder itself, it, you only, uh, you would see a, a break even at uh, um, this a percentage that's very small and even, and even a slightly at $44 uh, per thousand milligrams, um, uh, you, there, you see the, um, the um, break even point is, is, a, is a little bit higher than the first data point, but still not much at all. So pro prophylactic administration of local vanco powder during shoulder arthroplasty is a highly cost-effective practice. It, thinking about the concept of, well, if you're going to use the powder, how much more does it cost the case overall? And, you know, certainly in America, the cost of healthcare is potentially bankrupting America. So we're always thinking about costs. Uh, and, and I'm sure that that's the case in, in the rest of the world as well. Betadine irrigation, as opposed to uh, uh, vancomycin, uh, uh, powder. Uh, this study by uh, Van Meurs and others compared peroxide versus chlor chlorhexidine, and they uh, looked at cytotoxicity and bacterial cytal effect, and they showed that povidine iodine was optimal for irrigating the wound and comparing with uh, the others uh, in their uh, study. Antibiotic cement, Nowinski and others looked at this in JSCS 2012, and they saw that the uh, infection rate was 3% without the antibiotic cement and was uh, uh, um, closer to 0% infections in their group of patients, over 501 shoulders in the both groups. Uh, uh, and uh, um, so they felt that antibiotic bone cement can prevent later shoulder arthroplasty infection. So as you see, there's a lot, a number of factors that come into play. It's almost dizzying the number of factors. So I hope you're all still with me. Um, intraarticular antibiotic injection. Um, the, the, um, this group, uh, Lavallo and others, in, in JSCS uh, looked at uh, 160 milligrams into uh, the glenohumeral uh, joint versus none in a TSA grouping. And they uh, saw that uh, no injection, there was a 3% uh, infection rate. And uh, it, with injections, the uh, infection rate went down, rate went down statistically, and I would say clinically significantly. So they saw that as, uh, in, in intra-articular injection of antibiotic at the end of the surgery is beneficial. The wound closure and dressing, uh, Syed and others looked at uh, uh, staples and they showed that it leads to a higher wound infection. Uh, Cochrane review uh, uh, looked at tissue adhesives. I think it's the same review that I reviewed earlier uh, in, in, in relation to other factors. Uh, these adhesives that are almost like glues that can glue the skin wound uh, uh, close. They felt that they're helpful, but that there's a dehiscence or uh, opening of the wound potential. And um, uh, Journal of Hospital Infections, Bowler and others looked at uh, silver containing dressings, and they saw that they minimized the risk of, uh, of um, propionobacteria acnes.
What about systems thinking? Our group looked at uh, our array of uh, shoulder surgeons and asked them, how are you willing to change elements of your practice to standardize your shoulder replacement protocol? Because ultimately that's what we're talking about here. I'm giving you all this information and many of you will say, I wanna take some of those things home to my practice and change my practice. And so we asked them, are you willing to change elements? And if so, how many of the elements would you uh, change and you think it's reasonable and you see, Virtually everybody except uh, a, a few people thought that they would change some because uh, there's a number of people that said a zero, a one person, but you see the responses, some would change three and a greater number, nine people would change six, and uh, some would even be willing to change 10 or more of the factors. We've done a lot of work in this area, and we've looked at both uh, patient and procedure risk factors for deep infection published in clinical orthopedics and related research, and we um, um, were able to uh, present a, a surgeon controllable risk factors for uh, um, this same for uh, uh, for um, periprosthetic infection, and we analyzed a large number of patients in in the second study, and we're uh, we're able to present that at the uh, um, the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons are awaiting publication of that second uh, work there. So um, going back to one, one of the first studies I cited in the context portion, the introduction, the uh, uh, Clark et al. paper where uh, Rich Hawkins was the senior author, he, he was nice enough to share these uh, preoperative uh, um, um, parts of their protocol, chlorhexidine cloth wipes the night before and morning of surgery, standard uh, soap and water shower the morning of surgery, MRSA screening and treatment. Uh, it's the surgeons and institutions discretion whether they're going to screen and or treat. I kind of gave you that outline in terms of um, how to break that down. And then this concept of not needing to clip axillary hair unless the uh, hair obscures the visualization. Once again, surgeon's discretion. Uh, chlorhexidine with alcohol-based skin preparation solution right at the time, uh, like an hour or two before surgery, if, I, uh, if memory serves on that aspect of the uh, 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 preoperative uh, protocol. And then intraoperative uh, protocol, an intravenous uh, I, I antibiotic prophylaxis uh, one hour before the incision, and you see the uh, cephalosolin uh, for the uh, uh, standard surgical prophylaxis and vancomycin for penallergic patients. At a plastic adhesive drapes around drape edges, as I had shown you earlier, change uh, surgical outer gloves before draping, change knife blade before skin, uh, bef after the skin incision, and uh, probably better to use electrocautery after the skin incision due to the heat of the electrocautery also causing its own uh, bactericidal uh, effect. And uh, frequent surgical field irrigation with normal saline antibiotic impregnated cement if cementation is required during the arthroplasty, povidine iodine, uh, iodine irrigation so, uh, solution before closure, topical skin adhesives for epidermal closure, and silver-based post-operative dressing. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, I did want to talk about a couple other things. We are looking at the flu shot in orthopedic surgery, and you say, what does that have to do with infection? Well, you don't want to get the flu uh, influenza uh, at the time of, of surgery. And now, uh, this idea of perioperative vaccines, uh, uh, even especially with the concept of, of uh uh, um, uh, now the COVID-19 vaccine coming into play. So we looked at the flu vaccine itself. We looked at uh, um, uh, 23, uh, almost 2,400 of, 20, uh, of 24,000 uh, patients who were vaccinated pre-op. And then we took 2,300 um, 2, or over 2,300, which were vaccinated and not with the influenza vaccine. And we saw no increased risk of fever, infection, ED visits, or readmission. It's been a longstanding belief that surgeons say, oh, I don't want my patient to get the flu vaccine because they might show a fever and then people will think they're infected and that's not what's going on. We showed that they don't show a fever. They don't show signs of infection. So my point is to go ahead and vaccinate and that uh, paper is, uh, is pending publication right now. Um, there's a really great uh, group of uh, docs. I was invited into this grouping, but I want to let one of my uh, junior partners uh, go to this uh, meeting in Philadelphia that was uh, led by um, um, many, including uh, Grant Garagoos and others, 
and, and uh, looked at the idea of um, um, prevention of periprosthetic shoulder infection. So I wanted to share this. Uh, there was a series of four papers that uh, um, looked at this. And so I wanted to, since this is a prevention presentation, I certainly wanted to share this work. And uh, um, you see that this was the first systematic review to evaluate definitions and, and evidence of shoulder periprosthetic joint infection. They did a year long press process of 75 uh, parallel reviews. And you see these were the Five, four papers that came into play, a definition of what periprosthetic shoulder infection is, prevention itself, that is the um, uh, topic of this presentation as well. And, and I will uh, um, delineate uh, the many points they went through and that are very similar to what we've just gone through, but I thought it was important to share this great work. Uh, diagnosis and evaluation, then eventual management. I will not go over the first, third, or fourth, but they all come into play. So it's a really great grouping of articles that are available, I think, for free on JSES uh, um, and sort of open access for these papers because it's such a great public service for people to read this. And so in the work, they went through a Delphi process in July of 2018 in Philadelphia. Delegates discussed and voted on each statement or question as is the Delphi process many of you are familiar with. They um, merged the findings, they refined them, and then they voted on, and then they accepted certain findings at this ICM or international consensus meeting. It was, much, it was part of a much larger consensus meeting that was uh, performed, but uh, this uh, group, you know, and there was total hip, total knee, other, uh, other uh, um, operative cases that were discussed, but this was a shoulder specific grouping. So really great minds got together. So they asked many questions. I'm going to review them right now. They asked question one, what are the optimal perioperative antibiotics for primary shoulder arthroplasty? So they came to a great consensus, a really high degree of, of, of uh, um, unanimous strong consensus. And as we just discussed earlier, cefazolin, if there's no beta-lactam allergy, vanco for those with a uh, history and other types of vanco for uh, previous uh, serious, the second uh, serious uh, beta-lactam allergy. The second is somewhat similar to the first because you see the first question is primary shoulder arthroplasty. The second is revision shoulder arthroplasty. So in some ways the same, but they do add a second antibiotic in many cases for each of these groupings and their level of evidence it was consensus uh, and very high unanimous strong consensus. On to questions three and four, they asked, are there peri perioperative antibiotics that should be used for patients with specific preoperative pre risk factors? patient sex, comorbidities, et cetera. And they did not uh, um, find any patient-specific factors that justified a change in antimicrobial prophylaxis re recommendations. Um, the patients um, with MRSA coloniz colonization should receive a glycopeptide in addition to standard prophylaxis. Their question four was, what's the optimal duration of perioperative antibiotics following primary or revision shoulder arthroplasty? I'm going to tell you a caveat to this that's coming into play now, at least we're seeing a lot more of it in America. I'm sure it's uh, happening throughout the, the world in some way, shape or form, but let's just read what they came out with. In primary and revision cases, prophylactic antibiotics should be given within one hour prior to incision to decrease risk of infection, something we probably all do right now. IV antibiotics should only be continued for 24 hours postoperatively, unless there's a concern for periprosthetic infection. Antibiotics can be continued up till final culture results obtain, uh, are obtained in revision ca uh, cases. And if there's some suspicion of infection, you'll see question five, it's very similar answer. And although controversial, the current evidence suggests that prophylactic antibiotics should not be routinely held until tissue specimens for culture are obtained. That's the idea of the pre-op antibiotic being held until the culture, maybe just give it anyway, because it may not get to the point to uh, where, where the potential infection is and er eradicate the value of, of the uh, uh, culture by con contaminating it, so to speak, with an antibiotic to, to potentially kill bacteria 
area that you would otherwise be culturing. But my caveat that I discussed at the beginning of question four is in, in um, a lot of America, we're starting to think a lot more about same day or same day home recovery or send patients home same, same day. I don't know how much that's being accepted in other parts of the world, but certainly um, uh, more time is more money. So back to the idea of healthcare economics and trying to, uh, if it's safe for the patient, send them home the same day. So in many cases, if you send the patient home the same day, they certainly might only get one dose in the recovery room, and they certainly aren't going to get a, another dose at 24 hours because they're, they're just effectively not in the hospital. In my system in Southern California, we've already got to about 80% of our shoulder arthroplasties that are uh, certainly primary and not complicated. And, and many aged patients are going home the same day. So if anything, they're getting one dose in the recovery room, then going home. And some are not even getting that. And we're, start, we're, we're soon to study the differences in infection rates with ones who get no antibiotics post-operatively. And so I think it all goes to the idea of if you're practicing a very uh, um, safe, um, if you're practicing a safe uh, preoperative and perioperative regimen, you're going to do everything to uh, minimize the risk of infection. Although infection cannot go to zero, uh, we certainly think that uh, you can minimize that work. So um, let's go on to question six. Should antibiotic impregnated cement be used during shoulder arthroplasty primary in, in revision? Interestingly, even though that one study I quoted says that it's beneficial, this group of experts could not come to a, uh, um, uh, an agreement that it is. They came to an agreement that there's insufficient evidence to determine whether antibiotic impregnated cement should be used during primary or revision shoulder arthroplasty. Question seven, what is the role of topical intra-wound antiseptics and antibiotic powder during primary or shoulder revision arthroplasty? So it's just great. They're reviewing everything I've just talked to you about with all the experts. Once again, it's the Delphi process. It's just a bunch of experts, but they, there is a, a, a better standard with the Delphi process. They felt that dilute povidine iodine and or vancomycin powder may have a role in patients considered at high risk for periprosthetic joint infection or PJI after primary or revision shoulder arthroplasty. So it goes in favor of some of the ways that I, the ways I've described the literature to you. Uh, question eight. Do surgical drains influence the risk of infection in patients undergoing primary revision shoulder arthroplasty? There's no evidence to support routine use of closed suction drains in patients undergoing shoulder arthroplasty for the prevention of PGI. Since we send patients home same day, we, we do not put drains in. I haven't put drains in my shoulder arthroplasty patients for a long time and um, have had, uh, uh, knock on wood, uh, great success in not seeing high infection rates. What's the role of tranexamic acid or TXA during primary or revision shoulder arthroplasty in, in decreasing the risk? So once again, it's like, some, some might question, why were they even asking this question? Well, it decreases the amount of bleeding postoperatively, and some believe that large uh, bloody uh, um, and then hematoma-laden uh, um, ca uh, cases or, or in, uh, uh, operative areas can be a um, um, culture medium, so to speak, for infection. So the idea that if in giving tranexamic acid decreases that, does it uh, uh, decrease the risk of infection? They did not think that there was evidence uh, supporting routine use of TXA in patients undergoing shoulder arthroplasty for the prophylaxis of, of periprosthetic joint infection. They're not saying you shouldn't use TXA, and it's, TXA is a very cheap uh, 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 um, um, medication or drug mixed into IV, IV bags. So they're not saying you shouldn't use it for the, for the reason of stopping bleeding, but they're just saying you can also say, and I was uh, uh, by the literature hopefully able to decrease the risk of PJI. So I hope that's clear. And question 10, what's the role of medical comorbidities as potential risk factors for PGI following primary or revision shoulder arthroplasty? Specific patient medical comorbidities and demographic factors are potential risk factors for a shoulder PGI and appropriate preoperative evaluation and perioperative management should be standard practice. So it goes along with long held beliefs of trying to modify modifiable risk factors uh, that create and comorbidities that create a risk. Now, question 11, does previous ipsilateral non-arthroplasty shoulder surgery increase the risk of PGI? 
They believe that previous ipsilateral non-arthroplasty shoulder arthroplasty likely increases the risk. So this is a concept that if you've done an, a shoulder arthroscopy or, or, uh, earlier on in the patient's uh, um, uh, episode of care, or, or you've known the patient for a long time and did something uh, arthroscopically or some other open or arthroscopic non-arthroplasty procedure, when they have seen in there, there is a, 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 um, some limited level of evidence that shows that it increases the risk of later shoulder uh, periprosthetic infection when you place that second art, when you do that second uh, procedure or, or the procedure afterward that happens to be the arthroplasty. Almost done with these guys, but I think that it's important to share all of these uh, because of this great group uh, uh, and their their wonderful work. So question twelve: Does prior cortical steroid injection increase the risk of PJI? Um, an increased number of cortical steroid injections and a shorter, in, shorter interval between the injection and the arthroplasty may increase the risk of uh, um, um, deep infections and a periprosthetic uh, uh, infection. Some have used the, the idea that you should wait at least three months from the last shoulder uh, uh, cortical steroid injection before a shoulder arthroplasty and maybe even longer, but at least three months. Not part of this study, but I just wanted to share that too. Question 13, is there a role for preoperative skin scrubbing, home scrubs, washes uh, prior to primary revision shoulder arthroplasty? I showed you a lot of data on this earlier on. And so they also too believe that chlorhexidine, gluconate showers or cleansing wipes with at least two applications decrease the incidence of positive skin culture findings prior to shoulder surgery. Pending further research, this protocol may provide a benefit. The evidence was limited, but they all agreed that it's beneficial. And so, uh, did I, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, um, yeah. So uh, uh, question 16, should subcutaneous and dermal tissues be disinfected during shoulder arthroplasty? There's insufficient evidence for or against disinfection of the subcutaneous and dermal tissues during shoulder arthroplasty. There's really no great evidence they believe on this. And so uh, um, they did not believe that it was worthwhile. So that's the end of the questions from this uh, international consensus meeting group. And so I just wanna tell you in summary, um, I've taken you to almost 40 minutes uh, after the hour. Uh, the effective uh, uh, um, grouping of, uh, of pre and perioperative uh, measures to prevent infection include modify, uh, uh, working with modifiable risk factors, uh, preoperative skin prep, IV antibiotics, alcohol-based skin prep, double gloving, changing knife blade for the deep, and maybe using electrocautery, as was mentioned, shorter operative times, beta dyne irrigation, banco powder, and post-op silver dressing if they're not too expensive. Less or not effective are occlusive drapes, especially uh, certainly over the incision, hoods, laminar flow, staples, adhesive drapes, and tissue adhesives. So I've said this, I've said it uh, uh, through the international consensus, and now I'm kind of summarizing it here. So I really want to thank you for your time. Hopefully it wasn't too dry. And I just really think this is an interesting area. If we can prevent infections, I think we're uh, better off than dealing with the um, scourge of, of the infection itself and the multiple operations to eradicate the infection, especially after metallic implants are in. Dr. Gopala, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Navarro. Fantastic presentation. Really have gone into depth on each step. I mean, that makes a lot of difference uh, for those who practice not only shoulder surgery, it extends to other joints as well, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you, just you a few take home pearls. Sorry. Yeah, just uh, one or two questions. Uh, and what about MRSA screening for surgeons and operating room personnel? How do you oh. do that? How, how do you go ahead? What a wonderful question. You know, certainly um, the masks are in play for those um, um, individuals. I don't have data on whether the masks that we routinely use um, um, completely eradicate the risk, but we have not been routinely screening um, all the personnel. Now with COVID in play, COVID-19 in play, um, some people are routinely using uh, N95 masks. And so that may be even better to keep their 
infectious particles away from the operative field. But a wonderful question, I don't have a good answer to in terms of uh, studied materials and, and, and peer reviewed evidence. And is it, what about the KP group in general? Do you follow it in any of your related hospitals where you screen all the, I mean, the staff who are involved in the world? Uh, we do not routinely screen them. No, not at this time. I, I think, you know, I, I'm sure <laughs> it would be some uh, cost of, uh, cost effectiveness study that could tell us whether that was the case. We're not seeing a ton of, uh, of, of, of MRSA or any of the uh, types of infections that are uh, related to uh, uh, NARIs and that sort of thing. And I bet if we did, we'd probably do more of that. So, uh, yeah, the other question is regarding the use of intraoperative antibodies. You mentioned that I mean, vancomycin is being advocated by a lot of surgeons, even the consensus group, they are advocating vancomycin. And what is your personal practice? Do you use vancomycin or use gentamicin solution? Um, I use vancomycin powder routinely. I don't use it as much in the uh, a direct uh, operative site uh, at, at the level of the implants. I do close that first layer to get a, uh, a, a deep closure, if you will. So it's in the layer between the cuff and the uh, sub-Q tissues, if you will, uh, uh, to, to be more around there. Certainly we're doing a lot more reverse shoulder arthroplasty as probably many of you are. And, um, and you don't always, especially in cuff deficient patients, you don't have a clear, uh, closed uh, um, um, first uh, layer because there may be some open spots with a, uh, a cuff deficient patient and there may be open space to the uh, implant. I don't think it's bad. I just have my own personal preference there. Thank you, Dr. Navarro. Just one last question. Uh, the, the ICM Philly is almost like uh, it's getting accepted more and more, but ultimately it's just a consensus meeting, right? For example, if you compare the academies. CPG, the clinical practice guidelines. Those are far superior. So does the academy currently have something on the shoulder, shoulder infection, the CPGs? Are they out or is it in process? I think there's one in process right now as we speak. I, I'm not familiar with one. If, if there is one and, and others know of it, I, I, I stand corrected. Apologies. Thank you, Ron. I think that's all the questions that we have. Fantastic lecture. I'm sure this is going to reach a lot of people all over the world. It's going to be truly, truly beneficial to all of them who are practicing shoulder and other orthopedic surgeries. Thank I apologize. Much, oh, you're welcome. I apologize. It's it's not a, a flashy topic, but I think it's a topic that people can often refer to back, uh, going back to and say, oh, what did he say about that? What are they saying about this? It, it, and so I hope that there's long time use of the pearls, even though it wasn't a, a flashy operation type of- Yes, absolutely. So that's going to be a strong archive. It's going to be in the archives for years to go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Appreciate you. Bye-bye.